thank you, whoever survived, all of you who survived this set of three extremely dense presentations. Thanks for coming and for being here. Uh, we'll take questions now and we'll take a, you know, a few questions and then you can say if it's addressed to which of the speakers it's addressed to, you can say. And then we'll let each of the speakers answer it and we can take you know, more than one round of questions since we are all well within time. Yeah, go ahead. I'd request you just to, you know, just briefly just to say your name and introduce yourself. Just briefly, I'll ask your question. Hi, thank you. That was an excellent set of presentations and they were not heavy at all. Uh, I'm Dina Meluvalla. I'm from the World Bank. I just wanted to know, did you also check what was the frequency each household was actually availing this service? Like once in two years, once a year? Yeah, and I... I have just one more question is that uh, so in the first presentation uh, you mentioned that you know in Dehradun or I, I don't remember the name of the city there was some facility where the sludge was being dumped so uh, was the municipal authority charging something for dumping of the sludge or not only these two questions uh, in, okay Just one quick question. Oh. All right. So I'm Shruti from the Center for Equity Studies. Uh, thank you for all your presentations. They were really valuable, and really interesting. Uh, just one question. So in the summary of the three uh, presentations that came at the start of the third one, so they talked about uh, agreements that were made related to market allocation uh, in one of the sites that was surveyed. So. Could you t kind of talk more about how those agreements were made? Was it like on the basis of location? Because if it's like a one-time relationship between the uh, service provider and the customer, like how are agreements on market allocation actually made? Uh, hi, I'm Suneeti from Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Uh, great presentation is actually invigorating more questions. Uh, so, sorry if I have more than two or three. Uh, so, first to Tarun, uh, just additional information. So, uh, on what basis were the three cities chosen? Is there any specific criterion or any, is that a geophysical terrain conditions or the population or socioeconomic category or it's like combination or what is the criteria for selection of the three cities? And uh, the other question is to uh, Prashant, uh, is on the base case so when you said no licensing so for I'm coming from a place where we are working in Tamil Nadu and we are working in Trichy and two town panchayats near Coimbatore so the interaction and the um, experiences working with the desludging operators I'm coming from a very different angle because the Tamil Nadu here the trucks are in very good quality and the services which is offered by the desludging operators actually twice more than what they're offering here. So they cost, they charge anywhere between 800 to 1,500 per desludging. And of course, there are other variations also. So my question is, so in Trichy, for example, in order to get a license, they have to go to the uh, mechanical um, department and in the Trichy Corporation, and then they can submit the documents. It's verified by the AWE, and then they get the license, and they read out the gazettes. You know, you there is a set of rules which is also being followed. When you said that there is no licensing, I'm just curious as to, it might be very silly also to ask, but why is there no licensing or any interventions involved? So what is the role of the ULB here? Just to stop. Yeah, uh, my name is Manish. I'm from CPR. Uh, question to uh, all the panelists, but particularly to uh, Prashant and Anandita. Uh, <coughs> There are already some regulations in place. And uh, particularly from Shweta's presentation, I think it was clear that some of the profit that these people are making is a function of their non-compliance with existing regulations. Right. So in your presentation, you said that uh, there is a requirement for safety equipment, but most of them don't have it. Right? Uh, in Shweta's presentation, there was, a min there was a minimum wage that was being underpaid by about one third. So if you're making a profit of 20,000 by paying 9,000 instead of 13,000 as a wage, uh, how do you factor the how do you factor the, this part of compliance into your models? Because your uh, part of regulation also assumes that people will comply. 
and to what extent is non compliance uh, sort of to what extent does their non compliance affect their profitability the question that you asked uh, yes in the case of dehradun uh, the municipality had given them a guideline to dump uh, their sludge in a particular drain which was uh, uh, connected to a sewage treatment plant stp they were not charging anything now and this is after we have done the study and uh, we gave a call to one of the service provider they said that they are now charging per trip for that uh, dumping i'm not too sure about the exact amount but it is per trip at that time in dehradun these people were a little unionized so what they had done because they were asked to not dump it anywhere else uh, in unsafe places so within the union they were collecting uh, about uh, 500 rupees per operator which was on pretext of keeping the premises clean keeping the area where they are dumping clean so but there are other implicit costs for example in dehradun they park in front of a police station and that's not a designated parking spot but because uh, they are parking it there and they don't have to pay anything so there are these implicit cost uh, which are there but yeah they were not paying anything now they are paying but i'm not too sure about what is the amount but it is per trip yeah okay, uh, to answer uh, your question then uh, we did ask the residents how often they uh, empty their septic tanks but uh, which was done to just get a broad assessment of how often it's done so this varied uh, there was a wide uh, diversity as far as desludging was concerned within the settlements itself so in both the settlements we found that desludging could be done as often as 3 months or 6 months depending on the size of a septic tank and uh, sorry de depending on the size of the plot size and whereas for uh, households which were over say 70 uh, square yards or 100 square yards it could uh, be as frequent as 1 to 2 years but again uh, it all depended on the size of the household so big the bigger the uh, size of the household the more frequently they empty the tanks Uh, which was on the role of ULP? Uh, the three cities I'll uh, answer first. I think this was something that between CPR and uh, as we discussed, and uh, part of it was based on uh, the differential uh, penetration of sewer networks. So as you said, uh, as you saw in the presentation, uh, Dehradun is mostly unsewered, Jaipur is mostly sewered, and Bhubaneswar is somewhere in between. also in terms of the policy landscape it was uh, rajasthan had just come out with the uh, fsm regulation uh, modeled around the national fsm regulation in dehradun in uttarakhand there was absolutely no discussion around it and in uh, bhubaneswar there is a long history of it so i think this it was mostly uh, on some of these uh, factors that we chose these cities between us and cpr and uh, could you repeat your question i think there was a question on how these arrangements are formed the arrangement between yeah just in terms of so we talked about market allocation in between different operators who have in agreements between them so i was just wondering what those agreements were like were they based on the area were they based on the type of clients how okay. were those arrangements i think made? i think there is a distinction also in terms of i think uh, uh, so there in different cases there are some examples where there is absolutely no allocation uh, where uh, there are very informal uh, market allocation it is not you know put on paper saying that okay these are the areas where only this operator will operate and in there are areas where other operators operators will operate uh, there are these allocations which are mostly based on uh, i think completely word of mouth but there might be some overlap in terms of the same operators might operate in other areas as well so these arrangements are not uh, done in a very uh, you know then it's not very clearly defined i think that's what uh, what you also Uh, we see that the fall is taking center like Balrat, who is the biggest service provider and and owns Sail Craft, uh, kind of takes the call and allocates the, between themselves. But it's it's not written allocation or it's not based on whether Shweta is around house number four seventy six. Then Shweta goes. May not be uh, like those trends we couldn't capture in this. Also, in Jaipur's case, for example, uh, most of the uh, uh, locations where they service, uh, which is mostly informal housing, are on the fringe of the city, mm -hmm. and these operators are on the uh, ring road of Jaipur. 
So again, as a, because mo- the bulk of the service providers are on the fringe, then they end up operating for most of the market which is on that side. But then there are three or four operators which are in the old part of the city, near Ghatki Guni and uh, you know in the old fort area. So then it is based on the location uh, by default that these uh, you know allocations happen. You know, same in Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar had multiple places where they uh, they had an implicit understanding that this is a, these are the areas where only we will be situated. These are the areas where you would be situated. But in terms of the customer, I don't have a uh, you know I don't have a feeling that okay I'm only only going to call people who are there because if I have seen a phone number or if uh, through word of mouth I have heard about somebody else, I will just call that person. But there is no. Uh, I think evidence of saying that okay there is a centralized force which says that okay no you go to this allocated this allocated part. Yeah. Yeah. Time to begin. So uh, to Sunidhi, I guess what we mean by no licensing is just very simply that mm-hmm. there's no licensing that they just can start up that an operator doesn't need any kind of uh, permission or authorization from any kind of local authority to carry out this kind of activities and. That assumption is based basically on the fact that none of the case studies we've seen have reported any kind of licensing systems. It doesn't mean that there aren't regulations in place for it. There are. It's just not been enforced, and there's also not much awareness on the ground, as Shweta pointed out. Just to add to that, maybe we have found cases where these tractors, which are uh, basically used, uh, you know, opt-in for agricultural uses, are now being used for these collection services. And what is happening is these tractors, because they do not have any form of authorized licensing from these uh, urban local bodies, they, uh, most of the time they don't want to cross even the main road because then the police can come hard on them and ask, what are you doing, or why are you using, you know, whatever. So they have reported that they don't want to cross the main road as well in, in case there, or, or they do in the wee hours when, you know, at 6 a.m. in the morning when there is no one around, they can go too far off distance to service. But otherwise, as in uh, as you are pointing out in Tamil Nadu and Trichy, I think we are a long way. Uh, yeah, it's a long way to go there. I'll just respond to Manisha's question. So. Uh, yeah, how does regulation address the question of unsafe labor practices was the first one, right? So in the de- so the simple answer is that in our model, we don't change our labor costs at all. So that is something we will have to build on going forward. The reason is that I, I think we just couldn't find enough credible data to understand how these labor costs will change in a regulated market. How much is the cost of productive gear? Um, you know, how many workers will you charge? Will you cut down on, a, on your labor force because you have to give them protective gear? All these questions. Uh, the regulations, so the DGB regulations do do require that you have protective gear, but they don't outline, as far as I'm, cons- I think, as far as I know, any penalty for that. But I could be wrong. Um, what part of profitability in the base case and the non-regulated case is due to unsafe labor practices? A big, big amount because our labor costs are, I mean, they aren't as high as Shweta's cases, but it's between 20 to 24 percent. So you can only imagine that if those costs go up, then you know their their profits will go down. Yeah. So yes, there is a big um, so informality does does impact profitability. Um, yes. No, I have a question. Oh. I'm Samuel, uh, research scholar from Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies, JMU. And I have some three questions. One is the entrepreneurs, what you call, I can call them as contractors, are the serious violators in this case. Second, I didn't find any mes- me- mention of the MS Act, which brings in some kind of regulation with regard to this occupation. So I n- never found that in the presentations, which is something very serious. And the third part is actually with regard to the role of the urban local bodies, or maybe the Delhi being a metropolitan city, maybe the Jal Board, which acts as the role of water supply and sewage system. What kind of regulations are they bringing of these kind of, it's completely illegal. What the con- contractors are doing is illegal, actually. Letting it into the sewer without the approval of the Jal Board or the state uh, urban uh, division, they cannot do it. It's a serious violation. So how they are regulating it? 
then with regard to the hiring of laborers who are these laborers and what are the measures taken to avoid um, regarding the, how they are monitoring the working condition the living condition so that is also completely missing from the presentation and the fourth uh, thing is regarding the presentation of swati regarding the case study which she highlighted that the one of the contractors case study said he was uh, felt uh, stigmatized and he left what was his cause and uh, why uh, can you little more explain about that issue because uh, contractors are coming from the upper caste or the lower caste if he is from the lower caste now because there is a new scheme that is being brought out by the national commission national safai karmachari development corporation is a scheme has been brought that is the worker itself will be becoming an entrepreneur that means he will be given credit to purchase the device or a jetting machine or anything to clean the sewer or septic tank and he will be hired by the jal board or the urban local bodies so what kind uh, so anything that you had come out from your study regarding that how uh, that kind of system is it thank you I am Sanjay Singh from PSI. So I have two questions. I don't know which, from which presentation. Uh, uh, but my question is, is in regards to Aya Nagar, where you mentioned about equal delegation of work. Uh, I believe this will happen in very disciplined market. So how this happens and uh, how it benefits to the tanker operator or the consumer as well. Uh, my second question is in regards to the presentation where you talked about the cheaper access to finance. Uh, I understand these tanker operators get finance from the bank because these uh, tankers are registered in as a as a vehicle, so they they have access to finance. So what kind of finance are we are envisioning if we provide some sort of cheaper access? And what is the meaning of cheaper access? Because the bank is there to provide some sort of access to to the finance. Thank you. I am Rahul from GIZ. I'll start Anindita from you. Like you mentioned about, so I have basically some comments and some questions. So you had this comment of differential pricing. So just to share our experience, we had just prepared one, one, I would say a business model for one of the towns for which we had supported for uh, FSM treatment and all. So where we had introduced the differential treat, differential pricing. So basically we had very basic, simple bifurcations. So based on property taxes, very simple. So you don't have so many chances. So one is, bill, I would say, with tin sheds, so simple houses with tin sheds or kacha houses, and then you have pakka houses for residential and then institutional differently. That was one comment. Then question to Shweta, uh, you mentioned about this frequency of desludging, three months, two months. So I come to this basic question, are these septic tanks really septic tanks or these are holding tanks? So is the out, there is some outflow from these septic tanks or is it captured and are these watertight structures which are emptied regularly. That is one. And uh, then my question to Tarun here is, uh, uh, one comment here is like, there are the, you mentioned there is no policy, but uh, last year's Uttarakhand came up with septage management protocol, which is applicable to all the municipalities which have to go for by them. And it is a rule which is a regulation and they have to abide by them. So it is not that there is no such regulation or rule for that state, which is not applicable to that any city. So it is. It was in no, notified in September 2017. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, like, in the way forward, you mentioned improving working conditions, trainings, safety, right? And this is something I want to discuss here with everybody. Like, we talk about regularization, licensing everywhere. Even if you see the national guidelines or the recommendations, everybody talks about regularizing. But first is let's understand from the point of the government. To whom you, you can regularize? What what does regularization means? First is you allow them to dispose at a particular point. Now what is that point? Which is basically a treatment site. If it is not treated, then you are violating the EP Act or the Water Act. So you cannot allow anybody to dispose it in the open, right? Now if you talk uh, about numbers, how many towns in India are there? I say more than 4,000 towns. How many STP treatment facilities you have? Forget about FSTPs. Even if you go for co-treatment, the CPC says on paper, not even 500 towns are functioning, right? Say so. You see, most of them you don't have treatment facilities. So, can I, as a government authority, really 
regularize the system because I don't have a treatment facility, because I don't have a point for disposal, so can I regularize it? Not really, because I will be violating them. So then this question of regularizing is not really practical for them, because then they would be more answerable then. the business model, I wonder, because uh, taking into account the business model where there is an FSTP, because I think your point is very important, is whatever I've read or understood here or I've read from other cases, the idea is that FSTPs are of, the idea is that 50% will be kind of financed through the tipping fees and then the other percentage through the pricing that the customer pays somehow, right? My question is, if it is a public good, sanitation is a public good, and you decide that you want to work with these operators, why not subsidize them? Totally reverse, uh, I mean, the tipping fees, they have to pay to dispose for a service they provide because there is no sewage and good sanitation. I want to ensure good public health and public good. I would say uh, subsidize them, and if you subsidize them, maybe they will uh, improve their work, maybe they will give more money to labor. I mean, I don't know whether this model, which seems to be so dominant, is actually the right model. So just to open the debate on this. And absolutely, I think, uh, you know, whether it's the, the question of whether, you know, what is the right price to arrive at to have a reasonable level of service, which ensures that we can have the labor standards, we can comply with good labor standards, we can comply with good environmental standards, and we can have, uh, you know, a, a level of service that's reasonably certain and, you know, available in all sorts of locations it has to be the broad objective within which all of this, you know, discussion around septic tank operators has to be located. Uh, I'll come back to now all the panelists to, I mean, all the uh, presenters to just answer all these questions brief, uh, briefly. And then I think we have a few more questions, so we'll take one more round. And, okay, I, I'd like to go first. So uh, coming to your question, then I really don't agree uh, uh, when you call uh, these entrepreneurs the violators or uh, when you call these businesses illegal because the thing is that essentially if you look at it then these businesses have come up because of lack of foresight of the state because it never, it could never see the future that uh, sewage is not going to be uh, the only solution in place. So in fact, uh, these entrepreneurs are actually contributing in a very big way by providing some form of services to uh, households which are not served at all by the state. So that is one thing. And uh, uh, coming to the question of laborers, then uh, a lot of these laborers are actually uh, from agricultural backgrounds and uh, they, work, they used to work as casual field workers. And they come from the states of uh, UP and Haryana primarily. And uh, the working conditions are uh, really not, they're not great and they're not worth talking about and uh, not that uh, they have been provided with any kind of protective measures at all. And also we have seen that, uh, at least in one case, which in the case of Ayanagar, the uh, entrepreneurs were encouraging the consumption of alcohol uh, among the workers. And all, the, all of these workers were in fact, uh, a lot of them in fact, a majority of them were from the SP. So I don't think uh, it completely decomposes. Uh, yeah. The manual contact, as far as it's happening, there's a lot of violation happening in the sector. The reason why they are interested in the sector is because the mechanization, the potential for mechanizing the cleaning of septic tanks, also comes from the sector. Like basically. Ideally, in an ideal world, with a higher level of equipment and, you know, better tanks and with a better level of regulation and with, you know, better standards of containment structures, better construction of septic tanks, you would be able to have a situation where you are providing a mechanized service. So that's the potential story that, you know, that we would like to see. I mean, that's the whole talk around, you know, formalization, regularization, enterprise size. We are nowhere close to that yet, though. I mean... Yeah. All of this, all of this discussion is actually very preliminary in the sense that, you know, this is if this looks like very little data. There's no other data available about these people. Yeah. Uh, 
So, you know, but absolutely your concern, absolutely we appreciate it. Also, you had asked uh, about uh, uh, the particular entrepreneur who spoke about being stigmatized by his uh, friends. So this entrepreneur was a jata, but uh, jata from Ayanagar. But I wouldn't say that stigmatization was restricted to him because he was an SE. In fact, in the other side, uh, we found that uh, another entrepreneur who was a jat, he complained of uh, stigmatization. So he had difficulty finding a suitable match for his son. And uh, next, uh, coming to your question on equal delegation of work, then in Ayanagar, uh, the way how they do it is, uh, what they've done is that every day these entrepreneurs assemble uh, at this common ground. And uh, there's one uh, group of entrepreneurs uh, primarily the jata of entrepreneurs who overlook that uh, who oversee that work is uh, uh, work is divided between the entrepreneurs equally so what they do is that uh, they have this notebook and uh, in that particular notebook they record uh, how the uh, work is being allocated every day so every uh, entrepreneur is free to come and check this particular notebook and uh, in case they think that there are some discrepancies then they can question the entrepreneurs and so on and uh, uh, next, coming to your question of uh, the construction of septic tanks, I wouldn't say that these are proper functioning septic tanks. So I have just used the definition usually used by census, which uh, calls uh, holding chambers as septic tanks. So, <coughs> so as far as the construction of these uh, so-called septic tanks also go, then they also vary. So in some cases, that these could be completely sealed. They have no outflow uh, connection at all and for either gas or uh, the uh, effluent. And uh, in those cases, they could be emptied uh, after every three or six months. Uh, whereas there are certain uh, uh, cases of uh, septic tanks that were constructed such that there was some outflow as well. But uh, the, the outflow, uh, uh, the particular uh, outflow connection could be blocked with some kind of a cap on top. And again, it works like a holding chamber again itself. So yeah. I think a question that you had asked about was uh, uh, the role of ULB, I guess, and also it, uh, to uh, uh, respond, to add to what uh, Shweta was saying in terms of the perpetrators. I think there are parts of it which are in violation, which they definitely do, but in terms of an essential service, this is something that they're providing, and ULB itself is providing, so it's an essential service. You know, in Bhuvaneshwar and in Jaipur, uh, Jaipur, there are service providers who are empaneled with the municipality. In Bhuvaneshwar, there are actually nine trucks which are doing the same service. Uh, in terms of uh, regulation, also I think you asked that what is it the ULP is doing. In Bhuvaneshwar's case, uh, I think they, they are the ones, and I think Akshay would be able to tell a lot more in terms of what the uh, uh, the State Urban Development Department and the Municipal Corporation of Bhopal has done in terms of identifying the way in which these service providers are functioning, looking at their working hours, looking at you know the routes that they are taking. They are talking about even what I think Ananta included in her, uh, where they are trying to doing, uh, do a tagging of the houses where these septic tanks are there so that there is an efficient way of uh, rationalizing the routes. Uh, in Dehradun and Jaipur, uh, I'm not aware. I don't think that the municipality is doing a lot in terms of regulating the operators. Uh, they don't even know how many operators are there in their city. You know, uh, The corporation doesn't know that how many operators are operating. They have very ballpark figures. But uh, in Bhuvaneshwar's case, and definitely corporation is designing, designing the guidelines for better uh, streamlining of the operation of the operators. Also, you said something about the MSW Act. Uh, we didn't look specifically, but I think the MSW Act has mostly uh, addresses the fact of uh, you know co-treatment of the solid waste and the septage. But I don't know if. Uh, okay. No, he he said MSW Act. Okay. Sanjeeji, on the cheaper access to loans, um, what we were wondering, we don't know as of now whether. So the vehicle loan is definitely available. Most of the time they are able to acquire a cheaper rate of loan because they are not getting commercial vehicles. So the tractor, tractor loans are less expensive than uh, the commercial vehicle loan. But then that also bars them to get to the requisite licensing. So what by cheaper access to credit, I think what we want, meant was that for doing the entire enterprise, if that, that you, we can make credit worthy. Because they are, uh, you know, what are the risk potentials, how to li minimize the risk, and can this business itself be made credit worthy so that you know, banks are ready to give loans.
So that they are getting vehicle loans, no doubt about that. That also we see in our case studies. Right, so business model is only Yeah, but then the tanker also costs considerably, like 200,000 rupees down payment for these segment of people. I think that's quite, quite some money. Yes. So I think also the other thing we try to consider is that there is certainly, even in the unregulated and informal case, there are certainly examples where uh, they either use chit funds or they take mm -hmm. borrowings from their family and friends to finance it. So it's not like they don't have access to credit market, but they certainly don't have access to the formal credit market mm -hmm. because this, these are not the kind of enterprise that banks would, that banks tend to finance. I guess what we're trying to say is that if you did have access to the, to the institutional credit market, would that be cheaper for you or not? Take your question over the question. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just to go back to the model, we in the model we assume a tipping fee of 100 rupees uh, per trip, right? And they make on an average, if if they are making about 1400 trips a year, which is the base case, they are making about 600, 650 trips to the to the treatment facility. It comes out to be about 40. Uh, I mean, about like 600 and sorry, 666,000. Right, but somebody did a calculation that if you had a thirty thousand KLD uh, treatment facility and you had ten trucks carrying a full load of three thousand cubic liters to this truck, every, I mean, I mean, to this treatment facility every day, the tipping fee that you would charge to cover your full O&M cost is about three thousand rupees. So that balance of about twenty nine hundred or whatever it is is effectively is like is effectively going to be borne by the consumer, either through the form of property increased property taxes or as part of their water bill. And to add that means the best thing would be subsidizing low, but then whether the government has the potential to subsidize, that is one question one needs to ask. Uh, 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 even the... We have the Historically, is not the case. Which historically, is not the case. But the thing is, historically, the other fact either applied to where there were municipal night soil carriers, or it applied to where there were. No, I think there is a there is a scope. Okay. Also, there is a scope actually to understand uh, through some calculations, maybe going forward, if if the government has to subsidize the entire operation, subsidize as in substitute this entire operation and do it by themselves as a public good delivery. Would they be able to, you know, give services to this segment, like this huge, vast 1.2 billion, if, if you go to household, is it, is it possible, is it feasible to actually serve these kind of people? So that, I think, one needs to really work on. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Question, I, I just want to know what, what is the capacity of the containers that, uh, that you know, you use for the model? Yeah, for the purpose 3,000 liters. 3,000 liters. Leaders. And uh, uh, the other question is that, you know, uh, how much, uh, what is the capacity of, of, a, of a septic tank typically? So, on the pooling case, I mean, I, so I think you're asking about the pooling assumption, but basically we assumed that each septic tank is, is 1500 uh, cubic liters and the tank and the holding tank of the, like, like of the truck is 3000, so he can visit two houses at a maximum before he has to go down. The suction motor, which yeah, is suction. that that particular component, we don't know, but we do know that the container has been replaced every four years. I'm Shivani from Waterit. I have a question for Shweta. In your presentation, you have reported that in uh, Delhi, Krishna Nagar, they have a DJB notified site for disposal. So basically, what kind of site is it? Is it a STP pumping station and where final co-treatment is happening in the STP? Or is what is the final fate of a uh, septage which is disposed in that? So that particular chamber was uh, placed right across the road from a pumping, sewage pumping station in Amantika and also this uh, pumping station would then uh, pump or transport this uh, fecal sludge to the Ritala STP for treatment along with sewage.
Bombay and briefly advise her to be the Mavi Gandhi. What we are seeing here is an evolving system. And what we are seeing here is only the tip of the iceberg because with such a huge rollout of such Bharat, this is just a peep into the future. But this has happened earlier. In my own personal experience, it has happened. In Hardwar in 1990, in the Ganga Action Plan, the first STP of 18 MLT was commissioned without the sewer system. Now the contractor, if he completes it, he has to have his money because he will hand it over to you and go. Whether you have a sewer system, you don't have a sewer system. So his performance guarantees will lapse. So the STP was started, there was no sewer system, there were only a few septic tanks in the city and rest of it was manual scavenging. So the government of India provided trucks to the municipal corporation, the fecal matter from the pail depots and put it into the sump of the pumping station and this operation carried on for two years. And also something similar but three times the size. A company named, a German company named Storing had started manufacturing uh, Delhi Pit MTRs and uh, suction machines. And also uh, they were using some jetting machines for cleaning sewers. So some of them were purchased and gifted to the Municipal Corporation of Harwar so that they could keep emptying all the uh, septic tanks and bringing it to the pumping station sun. This operation also carried on for two years. But because it was with the municipal corporation, it was a highly inefficient operation. There were very strong rumors in the press that a lot of money exchanged hands between the civil party and the people who wanted to get the service provided to their households. And I have a feeling that it is perhaps the private sector with its entrepreneurial uh, zeal that it will be able to carry this kind of work forward. As far as madam's uh, concerns, a very genuine concern in trying to help a very poor segment of service providers by providing some form of subsidy. The experience, previous experience in this regard is that only the poorest get involved in this work out of dire need. The moment you provide any kind of facility or handout, the service goes completely knocked out. For example, if a tractor is provided to a person, if all of us contribute and provide a tractor, well, he'll sell it off the next day or rent it out because he needs the money and for him that is too much money. So chances are that if we provide too much subsidy or any kind of soft assistance, the service will get knocked out. It is completely on a need basis, need on all sides. And I think only thing that we can do is if you really want to help, we have to keep the local body off by from, and the police from harassing the service provider. Too much regulation will just kill it. Thanks for that closing. <laughs> I think we'll wrap up formally now. I know you guys have a few more questions. Your panelists are here. You can catch them and continue this conversation and you know, as we, dis as we discover in the course of all these studies, there's so much more that needs to be done and understood in this area. And unfortunately, that, doing, that understanding of the sector is not really happening. A lot of new regulations are being made everywhere. And, you know, trial and error, someone says, someone has a hunch that this may work or that may work. And not a lot of the new work that's happening on regulations is based on, you know, data or any kind of empirical evidence or any sort of, you know, actual uh, research into what is happening, you know, on the ground. So there's, you know, lots and lots of more work that needs to be done and lots and lots of more conversations and discussions that, you know, that need to happen about this. But thank you all and we close for now. Thank you.